Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. Hey, thank you so much for being with us here on the program. I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is to come your way uh, every time we do one of these uh, programs, these conversations is what they are, to uh, bring you new information. And today we are going to be looking at signs. That's right. We're going to be looking at signs. No, not the stop sign or the yield sign necessarily, although that could be. But we're going to talk with Simran, that is her name, uh, with her latest work, uh, which is uh, actually the uh, sequel, you might say, to uh, Conversations with the Universe. And uh, Simran, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation uh, and um, uh, helping to open my eyes and those of our listeners to those signs that we miss along the way. Thanks for being with us. I'm so delighted to be with you, Richard. And I know it's going to be a fun conversation, and it's also one that will offer a very simple, easy, personal growth path for individuals that keep bumping up against things that they don't understand. So you were right when you said, you know, stop sign, yield signs, because some of the signs do actually mean that. And yeah. some of the signs to actually say go and uh, leap and follow a new path. So let's dive right in. Yeah, that's shocking that you'd want to leave or or go or what have you. But that's kind of what happens. I uh, Matter of fact, what springs to mind first and foremost, I was working at a job um, and um, I was hired in the sales department. Now I'm not a salesman, not officially. I, 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 it's ironic. I'm really good at it, and yet I hate sales. <laughs> but I was hired by this radio station, the sales department, because they wanted to fire the program director and put me in his position. But they wanted to get their ducks in a row, and so on and so forth. So, um. And uh, the general manager treated me as if I was his best friend. And about a month goes by, they finally let the old program director go. And he and I, by the way, the program director and I, we got along great. And he knew what was happening. He didn't blame me. He just, he saw it as I was just taking advantage of an opportunity and he would have too. And so he helped me a great deal. So I was very appreciative of that, that I didn't create an enemy. Well, about a month goes by, I'm doing my job, and I like to think a great job, and all of a sudden, the general manager starts treating me as if I had just killed his best friend. Mm -hmm. And this went on for like nine months. And I even went into his office one evening before I left, and I said, what's going on? Why, why are you treating me like, I don't understand what's going on here. And he never really answered my question. I found out later what it was. The station was a tax write-off for the owners who did not live in the same city uh, and that he was there to make sure that the money station didn't make money. Ergo, I am not supposed to be improving the station. So anyway, they laid me off, gave me a huge severance package, which in this industry, you don't get. But I refused to quit. I refuse to leave. I've said, they're going to have to force me out. I love what I do. I like the people I'm working with, with the exception of the general manager. Now, I could have taken the sign, uh-huh, got to go. This guy is treating me horribly, and it's not fair, and da-da-da-da-da, so I should go. And I said, no, I'm not going to go. And it's not like it got any worse. It just never got any better. Um, and yet everybody knew what was going on and they were all sympathetic and they were supportive. And like I said, after nine months, uh, I was out the door. And, uh, so I, I would ask you this question in the regards to that specific example. Um, I mean, in hindsight, obviously it worked out because the next job I got, I was, I was embraced by this new station. It was like I had entered a new family, you know? It was, it was incredible. It was wonderful. Uh, so I, I really, it's like I turned the corner and wow, oh, thank you for letting me come in here, you know, out of the cold, so to speak. Did I miss the signs or 
is that sometimes what we have to do? We have to, we have to spend some time, what, uh, discerning and evaluating and so forth. Cause sometimes you don't, you don't snap to, uh, when a sign pops up, right? Oh my goodness. There's so much to share in what you just, <laughs> there's, so, there's so much. There's I do so that all the time. time. And I'm, I'm chomping at the bit to help you help explain this because this is going to be such a beautiful offering for your audience to really get a whole lot of points. So I want to start off first uh, that every experience that we have is just that. You are experience experiencing itself. And the signs are everywhere. The signs are everything. The title of the book is Signs, Sacred Encounters with Pathways, Turning Points, and Divine Guideposts. And this story that you've just shared, Richard, has pathways, turning points, and divine guideposts. We sometimes get them and we sometimes don't pick up on them. And I want to show you that, first of all, when whether you pick up on the signs or make the quote unquote right move or not, doesn't matter because at the end, you're going to get to your destination. If you follow the signs, it will be a straight pathway that's not so bumpy, that really allows you the smoothness, the ease, the abundance if you don't listen to the signs, you're going to get to go down a scenic route that might sometimes be a bumpy dirt road or go up a mountain or down into a valley. And that's kind of what you did. Um, basically, what happened was you had this position come available. It was almost like a state of ease just flowed you into a position that you didn't expect. And it was an opportunity, like you said, it was an open door. And there were probably signs that came along the way that said, you know, yeah, take this pathway, take this open door that's right in front of you. And I would venture to guess that somewhere in your heart, whether you were verbally saying it or not, you were asking for greater abundance. You were asking for more freedom. You were trying to find what direction am I really supposed to go and where am I really supposed to be? And that's what probably prompted this opportunity to even start. The person whose spot you took over, the only reason we ever get released from a job is because we're not happy. And to be let go is a sign that internally you've not been happy anyway. So you've been released to your destiny. Mm. And basically that's what happened to the first person that was in that position. He was released to his destiny. He really didn't want to be there, but he didn't follow the signs and move out of the way. So he had to be pushed out of the way and had to go through a darker experience to get him out of the way. But that created the space for you to slip in. And when you did, you performed a manifestation that we all do. And that's the nine month birth process. You were there for nine months. It was giving you the opportunity to cultivate certain gifts or to anchor into a certain mindset or to open to a vision, maybe because you weren't clear about where you wanted to go next or to anchor more fully into the confidence of who you were. Something was taking place in that nine months to amplify your gift skills and talents because that's how long birth takes, right? It takes mm -hmm. nine months to be born. And at that nine month period, you were offered abundance. You were offered freedom. Probably that thing that you really wanted in the first place at the beginning of that point when you slipped into that new position, but you didn't take the abundance. And that's where the listening has to happen. We have to be really clear on what we want because the signs are going to show up to mimic that. And because you didn't take that new doorway, that new turning point or pathway that was opening to you, you then had to go down a bumpy road for a little while longer. And that bumpy road usually looks like boredom, apathy, uh, continued shadow behavior around you, uh, perhaps confusion, questioning. Am I really supposed to be here? Should I have taken that? Should I have left? Should I stay? So you probably put yourself back into a place of confusion to where you had to be pushed out just like the person before you. But the beautiful thing is we are always on life support. The signs will always be there and the universe will always recalibrate to bring us back to where we were supposed to go. So that next place was already waiting for you. Had you taken the abundance, it would have been there to start with, but it somehow also made its way to where you were so that you still ended up where you were supposed to go. Hmm. We're talking with Simran. She's an author and she's an author, a catalyst for love, compassion, and humanity. Uh, what is this uh, 1111 lady? How did you uh, get that name? 
So my encounters with signs began in 2007 and I was going through my own dysfunctional experience. It happened to be a relationship. That's usually where we often encounter our greatest constrictions or bump up against our shadows or bump up against what the other person should be doing that they're not doing. And I had been in this arranged marriage, which really was very, very difficult. And I had tried everything to adjust myself, to become someone else, to do everything possible, to just help this person be a little bit happier. But I kept changing myself. And that made me less and less happy. It made me all of a sudden become someone that I was not. And it got to a point where there was so much pain that I realized I, I don't want to live like this. I This is not what love is supposed to feel like. And if this is what life really is, and I'm doing everything I can, and I'm being a good person, I don't understand the purpose of life. Why am I here? Certainly not to just completely suffer. And in my thought process, I went into my prayer room. I was very emotional. And I kind of half-heartedly yelled out, would you just send me a sign? Not really believing that a sign was going to come, but just needing to release the energy. Well, the very next day, a set of signs started coming and they came 40 to 50 times a week for the next four weeks. And they were the numbers 11, 111, and 1111. Now, 11 is a master number and it means the pursuit of self-mastery. 111, when it shows up, actually means be aware of your thoughts, because if you're thinking negatively, you're going to create negatively. If you're thinking positively, you open the pathway for positivity. And 1111 is the gateway to personal growth. It represents the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual places, the pillars that we all have to master. And this all got kind of downloaded or became a knowing after four weeks of seeing these signs on everything from license plates to billboards to store receipts to bulldozers, even a, pa a train passing by me with every boxcar, 20 of them in fact, with a giant 1111 on the side. Now, most people would say you had to be making that up or you must have thought you were going crazy or there's no way that that's possible. But I would say to you and your audience, there's something showing up for you and it's been showing up repeatedly. And it is a person, a place, a thing, a tapping, a number, a bird, an insect, but it's coming. And it's trying to get your attention to point you in the direction of the life you have been wanting. Interesting and very profound. I have been the, an observer specifically of, speaking of signs, especially when it comes to animals, those critters that cross my path, whether I'm driving or walking, I'll see a crow. And whether it's specifically a crow and it has a meaning there, or if it's a bird in, in general terms, and it has a meaning, or any other four-legged critter that might be scurrying across, uh, or uh, for that matter, even uh, any one of the three cats or the one dog or the two chickens that we do have that are, <laughs> that are that are there. Um, sometimes they're just there to be there. Um, uh, we used to sit out in the chicken run. Uh, we built a new one right up by the house so that they weren't so far away so we could keep an eye on them and protect them better. And we would go in there. We put this bench in there. We'd go in there with our favorite beverage, what have you, and we'd sit on the bench. And while these chickens, and some, we had upwards of five or six of them at one time, and one of them would jump up on the knee. And I mean, even one, I even have some photographs of where <laughs> one of them jumped up on my wife's head. <laughs> Not a comfortable feeling, but nonetheless, uh, a little surprising. But they're, it's like sometimes they're just there to for aid and comfort. That's all they're there for. That's the sign. Relax. Yeah. And what is it they say with pets? They, they, they especially uh, biologically, they will uh, help you to lower your blood pressure and, and those kinds of things. Well, and, it is definitely multi-layered. Yeah. Yeah. There's a surface meaning, and then there's a deeper meaning or feeling that they bring. And then there's actually a dialect that we each have that's very unique to us, where we start to connect the dots and we intuitively get a sense of what this specific thing means for me. And animals, birds, insects, those are just a few of the many ways that signs show up. 
In my new book, Signs, Sacred Encounters, I share many different types of signs and how they show up, why they show up, where they originate, and also some of the signs that we consider as bad omens and how they're really not. That's just conditioning that has taken place. This morning, I take a walk every single day, and this particular morning, I had a beautiful array of signs uh, with birds since you brought up animals. And on this particular morning, as I was walking, I was surrounded by, it must have been 50 or 60 swallows, and they just kept circling me. And it was the most beautiful and incredible experience watching these swallows dip and dive and just circle me that I stood there and experienced that feeling and that connection, that interconnection that we have with life. And I knew that uh, the swallows signified a sense of freedom and abundance and victory. And I have a situation coming up in my life this week where that's very, very much the energy and the focus that I've been wanting in that situation. And as I continued to walk, the next thing that I came across was a mallard, a male mallard uh, sitting at the end of the pond. And so that signified to me, okay, there's inspired action that's required here. This is male. Male means inspired action. It means bring in my masculine energy in this moment to actively do what needs to be done for this particular situation. And then as I continued to walk, the next thing that I saw was a pair of ducks, a male and a female. And they were walking side by side, right in unison, very, very calmly. And that spoke to me about the balance of my masculine and feminine nature and marrying that. So not just inspiredly acting, but then taking the time to sit back and nurture, to receive. And so our science will have lots of very intimate personal messages for us. And it's about learning how the universe really is guiding us. All of these mirrors that start to appear, they're related to what you're thinking in the moment. It's almost like you have this automatic response system. You know, kind of how when you are talking about something with a friend and all of a sudden you open your phone and then there's an ad of that very thing <laughs> and you kind of go, okay, who's watching me and mm. who's listening? Well, the universe is watching and listening. And as you're thinking something and feeling something and desiring something, the universe is paying attention and it's inviting you to have a conversation with it. But that conversation takes two. So the sign appearing is really just the first step. Mm. I am Simran.com is the website. I A M S I M R A N. Dot com. That's the website. And there's also another website that you can get to from that website. And it's 1111mag.com. Uh, again, uh, we're talking about uh, Simran's latest work. And that has to do with signs as we talk with her here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And it is uh, really a pleasure to uh, have an opportunity to uh, talk with, no, not the sign maker, uh, but the observer who has uh, kind of helped to put together the information to help us to understand those signs along the way. Um, I, I, sometimes these signs are not visible. Sometimes they're, they're impressions that we get from our higher self. And I encourage people on this program to take time during this, the decade of perfect vision, the 2020s, to go within and listen to that still small voice. Now, I had that experience. Um, I think it was the day or two following my father's passing, which was just recently on the 1st of March. And um, I wanted to call my mom. I wanted to see how she was doing and so forth. But there was a part of me that was like, what the hell are you going to say? I mean, what is there to say? You know? And so... I waited a couple of more days and then I did call, but because she's going through a different kind of grieving than I am as the son, the eldest son, um, I don't know. I just, I, I just had this impression that I just, I kind of need to let her um, be in her space. Even though someone said to me, well, yeah, but even if you just called and say, Hey, I'm here, I'm thinking of you, you know, sending you good energy and thoughts and so forth. Uh, as we all are going through this and so on. But I, again, I just had that feeling, wait, it's okay to wait. 
you know. Um, but that's where some of these signs come from as well is from our, I mean, and really the, the signs do come from our intuition, whether they're visible, whether they're auditory uh, or whether we sense them, you know, that sixth sense, right? I think you are correct in that they can come as seen or unseen signs. Unfortunately, because we're all so busy and we're in our heads and we're constantly moving and not taking that time to stop that you're talking about. We don't necessarily tap into the unseen ones, which is why life brings us the things that we can see. And as you read my book, Signs, Sacred Encounters, you'll discover that those seen signs can encompass almost everything. You said a really important point, Richard, and it was about being still and hearing that still small voice. And mm -hmm. this is a seven universal year. And for those that don't know about numerology, that seven stands for universally all of us slowing down and taking the time to really listen to what's going on. And I would say that means internally and externally to grow your own experience of signs in the third section of the book. I actually talk about how to cultivate your conversation, how to deepen your intuition, how to tap into this new way of listening, seeing, sensing, feeling, so that you become aware of all of the signs that are constantly surrounding you. You know, what your mother needed in that moment really wasn't anything that you had to say. Mm. Just being on the phone and listening would have been the most powerful thing you could have given her. And she is showing up as the sign again of that feminine. And in this case, the the sacred feminine. So for individuals that are not familiar, we all have a masculine and feminine side, one that is the general and one that is the more sacred. And the sacred feminine is about deep nurturing. It's about diving deep and feeling all the emotions that we don't necessarily want to feel. And those emotions are really rampant in our world right now. So we're serving the world if we're willing to go into those places. And one of the most powerful places happens to be grief. And so she was also being a sign for you to really allow yourself to deepen into that feminine side of yourself, that bowl of sacred emotion that we all carry and let yourself listen for the grief or the messages or the words that needed to come. Mm -hmm. There's another way that signs show up that people may not be aware of. And that is, and this can go back to the animal conversation we were talking about, or just generally, you know, you might get a, a picture of a giraffe or you might have some other thing that's not necessarily a 3D type of sign showing up in front of you, but might come across a fax machine or an email. Those two, if they make you pause or take a look, those are signs and they're, they're showing you something about you. Again, mm -hmm. you're on a journey. You are the journey. You're not in the world. You are every piece and part of the world speaking back to you about you. Hmm. Quite profound to say the very least. Uh, I, and I, I, I really do my best. And I would like to think that uh, those listening uh, who are sort of attuned in the same way are just doing their best uh, to uh, be aware of these signs, uh, uh, you know, there are times when <laughs> I don't want to look, I don't want to, I don't want to anymore. Not right now. I, I'm tired of <laughs> being aware of these signs. <clears throat> we, I had a conversation just recently with one of my guests and uh, talking about the difference between being awake. Okay. To the signs as we're talking here versus this. And I, I say it's pejorative now because of how it's been twisted, the word woke. I can't stand that word anymore. I know what it meant some a couple of three years ago, but it's been so twisted uh, that it, it, I don't know what it means anymore, but I want us to wake up. Uh, and we do that every day. The signs that come along, you talk about this in your book. Um, we 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 do need to wake up to these signs and realize what is truly important. And would I be fair uh, in my assessment if we're getting the impulse 
to turn the TV off, to put the newspaper down, to turn off the radio. I hope they don't, but <laughs> but uh, also go on demand to listen to these programs. <clears throat> uh, but to to stay away from th- what I'll call the the minutia that's out there that distracts us from waking up. I always say awake and aware together in the same sentence. I never just say awake because the spiritual words, especially they have so many contexts based on where you are in your journey and how you've been conditioned by whether it's the general world or even the spiritual world and everything has a shadow side and a light side. And I think that's also why it's so important now to slow down and to pause and to listen and to come up with your own understanding of what these words mean, of what your signs mean, of all these types of things. You're not wrong in what you're saying, Richard, when it comes to personal growth. It can be hard. It can be drudgery. It can be something you want to close the door on because it just gets to be too much. And honestly, science has become and has always been from the time I started seeing the 1111, my singular personal growth path. It allowed the personal growth work and the spiritual development to somehow be lighter. It didn't mean that every moment felt great. There were still these moments where you dip down into sadness and grief or uncover a shadow that you didn't know that you had. But all of a sudden, it was more of an adventure. It was like looking at life like an adventure theme park and discovering that I'm going to ride different rides or go through different landscapes and really discover all of the different parts of myself in this way that is more playful. And ultimately what the universe is trying to get us to do is to get back to our more innocent, playful space of wonder like we had as a child. Mm -hmm. In fact, the signs originate from our inner child. That is that inner child has planted them, or you could say our soul has, or if you want to believe God or the universe has, Mm -hmm. there is a relationship that's happening here that's really, really beautiful. And so for people that are kind of tired of all of the drudgery in personal growth, I would say this is a great path that will make it more playful, more fun, and allow you to have the respite from time to time, rather than making this so serious, because we really are way too serious as a human species oh my goodness i couldn't agree with you more and some of the things that that i can recall coming up uh and you talk about that inner child and the one phrase biblical phrase that comes to mind come to me as little children not childish childlike as as little children and obviously he's speaking to the adults uh, and that means with that inner innocence, with that wonder. Um, when my father passed, and my my older sister um, shared this with me, we we were trying to stay stay light and 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 breezy, so to speak. And she made the comment that um, we're halfway to being orphans, you know. And I. <laughs> I had to chuckle. I said, well, yeah, okay. Yeah, you you have a point there. I just hope someone would be willing to adopt us. <laughs> um, but then again, my father, he's still here. Uh, that's one of the things I say is that uh, whether it's my elder sister who passed last year or my father this year, uh, they were in one spot, in one place. Now they're everywhere. And now everywhere, yes. And yes. I talk, I talk to my dad a lot more now. Um Sometimes it's, what am I supposed to do now? I'm in this situation and now what am I supposed to do? You know, and then I, I just kind of put that out there and I don't really think about it. I just, I just kind of just put it out there and it's not like I'm expecting him uh, or his essence to solve my problem or my challenge. Um, Maybe what comes across is a sense of, of peace a sense of hey it's a, wh- whatever you're going through it's okay you're doing fine that was the one thing that uh i don't know about you and i'm sure you've had people in your life that have have gone on uh from this life this world um i know that there are those who have had their parents pass on and they say oh if oh, i wish i had said i wish i had said i wish i had said i don't and I'm so glad that I don't, 
And I, I say this in many of the programs of late because I think it's important. If, you're, if your family is still with you, if there's someone that's close to you that's still with you, tell them. Do not allow them, well, not that you have control over this, but don't wait until they're on their deathbed or they've left and now it's like, oh, I wish I had said whatever it was you wish you had said. Say it now. Uh, it's so important. That's so beautiful and it's so true. And one of the really powerful things that comes across in the new book is the middle section because it is a section filled with the sacred stories of so many other people who've encountered their own signs. And there are a couple of really beautiful stories about individuals who had a loved one pass on and the messages that they got from the loved one, like symbols that would show up that they really identified as that person, like feathers or a key or something specific that would show up. And I try to teach people through the book how to develop that conversation with the universe, with the loved one that's passed mm -hmm. on, with life in general, or with one's own soul. Because you really can not only speak to that one, the veils are very thin. We are interconnected between the seen and the unseen. But you can literally ask for a sign. Dad, show me something undeniable that I will start to see every time you're around me, every time you're trying to give me a message. Mm -hmm. And then just become aware of what shows up repeatedly, because I have found that life will always use the very thing that you will recognize, that you are comfortable with. And we're not just having a sign randomly every once in a while. What you will come to realize is we are having these signs all of the time. We just haven't been awake and aware to them. But once you start becoming awake and aware to them and to the feelings that you're having inside yourself, you're going to see that they're cascading throughout your day, that you can string them together and actually they're forming full dialogues, conversations, paragraphs to you that are leading you to a certain pathway or a turning point or are that divine guidepost to let you feel that hug or that embrace or that connection to life so that you can trust in a little bigger way. Absolutely. Simran's my guest. I am Simran.com is the website. And you, my friends, are listening to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And uh, it's really, uh, uh, it's kind of cool to be able to talk with you, Simran, uh, about uh, these signs. Um, I am a person who loves to see patterns. All right. I have what is called kinesthesia. There is no medication. And even if there was, I wouldn't take it because kinesthesia is kind of cool. Uh, I see colors in letters and numbers. Uh, and then when you start putting those letters and or the numbers together, I see shades of the combinations of those letters and numbers. But I also see patterns when I'm looking at a clock. And of course, now we have the digital clock. It isn't real effective on a, a clock with hands. Uh, spinning around, uh, I'll see 1111 or 1212 or 1234 or 789. Uh, well, no, you wouldn't have 7890. <laughs> anyway, but you get the point. Yes. When we see those patterns that I don't want to say they trigger an awareness, but they trigger something that says, oh, there's 1111. Or there's three, 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 or whatever the numbers are. Um, is is there a sort of a, a a generic understanding of those kinds of patterns? Let's say when we're looking at a clock, or for that matter, a calendar. <clears throat> um, and and I'll use this as a case in point. My father was born in 1931. He was born on the 13th of August. My father, his eldest daughter, passed away on the 29th of March of 2022. He waited, I say waited, until March 1st of 2023. Now, that's a 3-1. March 1st, 3-1. He was born in 31. And I look at March as the portal for them. She was the way shower, and he followed. 
Um, which actually, I don't know that I want to say it necessarily gives me comfort, but I mean, it feels good, you know, to, to think of it that way, <clears throat> that this was sort of, I don't want to say preordained, but you know what I'm saying? There's that pattern there. There's those symbols. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, looking at those kinds of symbols um, without overthinking it? You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes that's what we will do as humans. We'll get into the mind of, I got to process and okay, it means this and this and, and and we actually can drive ourselves crazy. Yes, it's natural for us to do that because we live in such a heady, fast paced society, but we are composed of patterns and life is this series of cycles, rhythms and patterns. And I very much uh, resonate with what you said, because that's what I see. That's what has led me down this path of signs. And I talk about in the book. Uh, also something called echoes, where there are these repetitions of signs across time, kind of like what you have said and what they mean. And I actually share some of my own stories to help break down how I put these conversations together and understand them, not from that linear heady space where we go into over-analysis paralysis, but from the space of dropping down into the body and really understanding it from this deeper integration of both the human level and the soul level. The numbers that you talked about seeing, and if people don't see 1111, don't be surprised after seeing the show or hearing me, you're probably going to start to see it. And it's just a symbol of confirmation, uh, or you are seeing something. And the numbers particularly can come and express two things. Either they're expressing that you take an action or you're in the process of an action and how to move, or they're expressing to you where you are on your spiritual growth path. So as people start to dive into personal growth and spiritual development, they will start seeing the double numbers, the 11, the 22, the 33, the 44, those are the master numbers. And as they progress on that spiritual path, oftentimes people change careers. They want to get more into areas that are holistic or serving the public or coaching or doing something that allows their voice to express more. And they'll start to see the 55 because the 55 is about using your voice or it's about branding or marketing. And the 555 is an amplification of that. As you really step into greater mastery and you start diving into not just this outer world expression and how you can personally grow externally, but you start to deepen in the involution aspect of yourself, mm -hmm. you're diving in and learning about all of you, not just the, the bright light parts of you, but also the, the depths of you and the shadows and all of those things, you're going to start to step into the numbers of mastery, which are your 111, your 222, your 444, 777, all of your triple numbers. So those are all basically showing you the ladder of your own awareness so that you can kind of gauge where you are in your own spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. And then there are numbers like the one, two, three that you talked about. Mm -hmm. I just had someone on Facebook uh, that mentioned that that's the number they always see. And I explained to them one, two, three, four, that type of sequence is actually giving you two messages. It's saying, number one, stay in the step you're in. Don't rush too fast to the next step. Everything is being built methodically for you. You have to stay where you are, be here now. It's also saying you're building a framework. You're on the right path. Just keep moving forward one step at a time. And so you're going to find that you can explore the meanings of these numbers from a general standpoint. You'll find lots of meanings in both of my books on this subject. You can also Google all kinds of things. You can Google numbers, animals, flowers, all types of things. And then as you get comfortable with that, I would say step back from all the general meanings that you find, take a pause, take a breath and ask yourself, what does this mean to me? Mm -hmm. And you're going to start to deepen your intuition and expand your own dialect with the universe. And you said one other thing, Richard, and that was that you see these numbers or you see these things and they kind of make you pause. That's what they're designed to do. That's when you know it is a real sign because it will all of a sudden go, oh, I just saw that again. It will in your body make you pause or you will even mentally ask yourself, was that a sign? That's how you know you have actually encountered a communication from life or the universe. Can we overthink it? In other words, every time I turn around, if I see this or that or the other in terms of numbers, a matter of fact, a good friend of mine that I produce for, uh, uh, he's been seeing 1111 since the passing of uh, a good friend of his, the actress Anne Haish. Uh, who I also knew very well as well. 
And so he's been seeing this, although he hasn't mentioned it recently. So maybe maybe they've they, they've stopped. But uh, how do we know when we've gone far enough and when we've gone too far if we ever if we're overthinking it? You know, I think the signs really do always appear to get us more into our body and our feeling. And so if you find yourself just staying on the surface of constantly looking up what it means, but then moving on with life, then you're really not taking the full advantage of the signs as they're appearing. What they're asking you to do is to pause, to drop down into your body, to go from the neck down rather than the neck up, and to really feel into not only what's coursing through you, but to look at what was I thinking about right before the sign appeared? Because it will always be related to exactly what you were thinking of. And most often we are thinking of a change we want to make in our life, but we're too afraid or a shift in a relationship, but we are guarded as to what that might do or a dream that we have that we don't quite have the confidence in to take. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are showing up to basically say the universe has your back. We're going to open the doorways but you've got to take the step for us to help you. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say a conversation takes two. When you get that sign, you can't just wait for another sign because it might not come because that the universe has spoken. And now it's your turn to take the inspired action or to make the move or to make a decision. And then you'll get another sign. We are talking with Simran. I am Simran.com is the website. And guess what? You're listening to tell me your story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and uh, you are listening to Tell Me Your Story. I had a day, <clears throat> it was a Sunday, I think I was seven, maybe eight years old, and throughout the whole day, I was having these experiences that I thought I was going to go mad. I thought I was going to go, a seven-year-old thinking he's going to go crazy. They were deja vu experiences. Are those, I can tell you what my interpretation is, but I want to know from you, are those signs too? I think they are a type of sign. I do talk about deja vu in my book as well. And I think that they are giving you fast forward glimpses of things that will happen to you that actually are already happening. Because I, in my other books, I talk about how we are multidimensional and how we exist all at the same time. And we're tapping into different experiences based on where our presence is. And so the deja vu experiences are just helping you to understand that you are greater than you think you are, that you really are the universe, not just in a universe. Mm. And that lets you know that you can tap into a lot more than you've allowed yourself. I, uh, uh, my interpretation of my deja vu moments is the universe is just telling me you're doing fine. You're on the right course. Just keep moving ahead. Now I haven't had too many of those in the last few years and it doesn't bother me that I haven't, uh, because apparently I haven't needed them. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, and, and I have to say that it's really kind of cool when they do happen, happen, especially, um, I want to touch it. I want to, uh, kind of shift over into from deja vu to dreams. Catch this. <clears throat> I had a dream where I was driving on a freeway. Uh, there were, there were, uh, it was a large forest to my right as I'm traveling along. Sun is up. The freeway is shadowed by the shade from the trees. And there's a road turning off of the freeway. And now, by the way, I am driving a white uh, a van. Uh, we'll say a, a white uh, a Dodge Caravan. And I drive into this huge meadow. And there's this beautiful stone house with arched windows in the front. And I pull up. I get out. I go in the front door. And there's my grandmother, my mother's mother. She doesn't say a word. She gives me a hug and I get the impression everything's okay. Everything's okay. Now, you'd think that it's that last part that's the significant part, but it isn't. I was born legally blind. I had a lens, lens implant in 1996. Are you ready for the numbers here? Three, six, 
26, uh, 96, 26, three, six, 96. Now, first of all, the threes are going wild there. Second of all, it happened in March. Go back to what I said before about the portal. Um, a few years later, after I had gotten my driver's license, my parents sold me their white Dodge Caravan. And there I am driving on the freeways of Phoenix. Now, I never did come across a forest, the shadows uh, 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 overshadowing the freeway. But I remember going back to that dream and going, wow, in addition to getting a little comfort from my grandmother from the other side, it was almost like a premonition of the future. All right. Um, to me, those are those are extraordinary, but we don't always know what they mean, even at the time. It's like we have to let time pass and things happen, in my instance, for example. And then we go back to that dream and go, oh, how cool. Um, and I had given up the desire to drive, especially because I kept running into a brick wall with the Arizona DMV. <clears throat> but then I found out when I moved to California, Oh, no, I take that back. I was in Arizona. I got my license. I found out about the medical review program. Boom. My doctor signed off, my ophthalmologist, and 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 the rest is, uh, as they say, history. Um, what about uh, uh, getting signs within uh, dreams? And then, as you've already elucidated, spending that time pausing to say, okay, what, what does that mean? And not going to somebody else because someone else's interpretation of the symbols in your dream are going to mean something totally different to them than it would to you. Yes. Yeah. It's, you know, I believe that we get our signs and symbols everywhere. And the dreamscape is the place where our soul or our subconscious can really speak to us. And it really does only speak to us through signs and symbols. And so you can look at things in many ways. I, I tell people we are multidimensional and everything that we encounter is also multidimensional. So if you're looking at things from the human mind space, then you're going to look at it one way and it is going to be more linear and time oriented, kind of like how you looked at this being either prophetic or going back and looking at across time, what it was meant to share. If you look at it from your emotional landscape, then all of a sudden you're getting into more of the feelings. And I've always thought that in our dreams, everything in the dream is actually us. And so when I tell people and how I share in the book in, in one of the sections is look at everyone in the dream as you. You're seeing them because you have a certain judgment about them, good or bad. And you're really seeing that part of yourself. And so for your grandmother, you may have been seeing the part of her that you loved. Maybe she was really nurturing. Maybe it was uh, very comforting. Maybe it was really sweet. And coming to her and having that hug was really coming to your older, higher, uh, further away self mm -hmm. than where you were in that moment. And because you can't recognize that about you, you put someone else's face on it. And we do that in life. And that's why I tell everyone that as you dive deeper into this book and start to really see what signs are, you're going to start to discover that everyone and everything is you speaking back to you. So when you encounter that angry grocery store clerk in the grocery store, you're not encountering someone who's had a bad day and being the brunt of that. What you're encountering is the aspect of you that is hidden away that is holding anger. And it becomes this opportunity for you to look at life as a constant set of reflections. And those reflections will help you to grow, to expand, to illuminate parts of yourself that are hidden away. We have no idea of how unconscious we are because it's unconscious, but we have a whole virtual reality out in front of us that is showing us the places that we can't see. And that is the magnificence of signs. That is how we make what is ordinary, extraordinary. That is how we allow the mystical to infiltrate our everyday mundane. 
IamSimmerin.com and 1111magmag.com. You can get to 1111mag.com through IamSimmerin.com, which we will be linked to so that you can find out more about the work that she is doing. And we're going to talk about some of that work here in just a moment on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it is really a, a pleasure to have you with us. You are also an artist, and uh, I've been looking and scrolling through some of this incredible art on your website, um, Rainbow People and The Eye and some of these others that are just, uh, they're really very cool. I like, if I'm using the right term here, correct me if I'm wrong, I love the abstractness of those particular items, but you also have <clears throat> what look like, I don't know if they're sketches or what have you, <clears throat> the unknowing, uh, I think that's perspectives, tree of life. Uh, talk to us about, uh, these, because uh, uh, it does look like there, well, no, there's three. There's a more than uh, one uh, form of art that you're doing there. Uh, a, you know, the uh, soul family, the family, and so forth. Tell us about the, the, this this uh, artwork that you produce that is available for purchase on your website. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. I uh, went through some experiences that have allowed me to go into very deep meditations where I have tapped into my own subconscious and also the subconscious of the collective. And uh, when I go into that place, I simply paint what comes out. My life, and you will see that 1111 Magazine and 1111 Talk Radio are completely devoted to the journey of the soul. And so the artwork is the soul experience. The sketches that you were referring to, that is actually the journey of the soul into the human experience and what we uh, grow into, what we have to dissolve, what we break down as we return back into soul and spirit and universe. And some of the other ones are actually the origination from infinity into form. And so these are all images that depict different aspects that we have moved through in incarnating into what we call human beings, but actually being the divine on legs and not remembering that until we remember that. Mm. And so the paintings are painted to help people remember those things. And all of my work uh, is incremental in allowing individuals to personally grow, to find themselves within the books or to have uh, sacred works that will allow them to pause, to slow, to understand not only who they are, but who they are in this larger world and how we actually will ripple out as part of the healing by doing our own work. And that's the real key right there, doing our own work. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. In spite of the fact that <clears throat> every once in a while I'm going, would somebody take over, please? I'm I'm tired. I just, I don't want to do no more right now. I did a lot of personal growth back in the eighties and early nineties, uh, in my twenties and early thirties. And I went through a program called life spring, which was an outgrowth of Est. Uh, and it was, it was a great experience. Uh, it wasn't cheap either, but the universe made a way. And that was the one thing that really struck me, uh, was how that happened. Uh, but also went through a program that was actually free, and you just you gave what you could. Uh, and um, um, it was based upon the work of, I believe, Teilhard, uh, 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 Teilhard and the zero point. But it expanded from there to encompass so many other uh, um, ways of thinking that might be contained in the ancient, ancient wisdom teachings. Uh, but they are relevant. One of the things that I want to talk to you about now has to do with individual experiences, truth, the truth, and uh, basically, and reality and perception. There was a movie that I was watching, and the protagonist said, There is no reality, there is only perception. And I thought about that for a long time. And there is serious truth to that. 
because what you see right now as we're conversing is not what I see. Ergo, my experience is different than yours, in spite of the fact that here we are conversing and so on and so forth. Uh, and then th there was uh, an interesting, a comedian was actually telling this one. Uh, he was talking about, uh, he says, you know, if someone comes up to you and says, there are no absolute truths, your response should be, well, there's at least one that there are no absolute truths. <laughs> But it's not about the truth, but it's about our individual truth that may not, my, my truth may not mesh with yours, but I would venture it probably does because we're both on that same kind of path, not the same path, but the same kind of path, right? You know, I, that goes into a conversation that expands a little further. I, I wrote four books in the last two years and signs was one of them. It is a, a beautiful way, like I said, for people to venture into that personal growth arena. And I talk a bit about this multidimensionality because that's how I hear you when you're saying, you know, there's different versions of truth. There's not one truth. There is one truth. And yes, all of the above are true. And so we can look at ourselves through the world and following these signs and expand into our individual truth. But the more we do that, we will start to see the collective truth, which is different. The trilogy that I wrote, the first book is called Living the Seven Blessings of Human Experience. And the first blessing is the blessing of life. And within each of the blessings, there is a certain gift that comes from that blessing. Mm -hmm. The gifts that come from the blessing of life happen to be the gifts of signs, symbols, and synchronicities, which is why I tell people to get the book signs, because it really will open you to more of yourself. It will open you to trusting life better, trusting the universe, uh, trusting yourself in a way, because most people don't. We don't trust the world. We don't trust life. We don't trust our relationships. And most importantly, we don't trust our own choices and decisions. And so the purpose of sign sacred encounters is to help you really ground into a place where you trust. Because when you do, you move into greater blessings and graces that are allowed for you. For individuals that really want to open up to the full power of who they are and all these versions of truth that you're talking about, what I typically recommend to do is get the book signs because that one is going to be one that you move through rather quickly. It's going to be fun and light and playful and open your eyes in a way that you've never seen before. My one guarantee is you will never look at life the same way. While you do that, the trilogy that I have written called Living, Being, and Knowing is not like ordinary books. They're not meant to be read fast. In fact, you can't even read them fast if you try. They're not written that way. I only want you to read a paragraph a day out of each book, period, because they have to marinate. They're designed to slow you down. And so as you start to encounter the signs and really grow in that way, the trilogy becomes a sacred oracle that truly helps you understand how to deepen into yourself. And most people might say, well, how do you read four books at one time? You're not. You're using the other three more as an oracle. You're reading signs or you're reading anything else that you want to read at the time. Uh, I know you can do it because I wrote for it one time and I never thought I could do that. And that just illustrates how powerful we are. We put a cap on our minds, our hearts, our expressions, because We've been conditioned into believing that we have limits. And the truth is we have no limits. We are infinity embodied. Ooh, that was actually one of the questions that I used to ask at the end of the show. Uh, how powerful are we? You know, and uh, I think someone even made the reference to we're more powerful than the most powerful atomic bomb, you know, uh, which I thought was a rather interesting <laughs> comparison, but accurate in that. Yeah, we as human beings, we can either create and be constructive and build the most magnificent civilization that the world has ever seen, or we can destroy ourselves and wipe wipe the planet uh, clean of our existence. And there is evidence to the fact that we've done that a few times uh, over the millennia. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, we're very, very powerful beings. I think the one thing that I find interesting, uh, <clears throat> Simran, is 
the challenge that we face, you and I and others like us, who are wanting to make this a better place for everybody, who are wanting to, as I put it this way, I want to change the world. I don't know about you. I want to change the world for the better for everyone. But not everybody has the same idea of what that's going to look like. And so the more people who are seeing the signs, as you talk about in your book, signs, um, the more in alignment we all are. Now, that doesn't mean that we all agree. Uh, and that's not what I'm saying. But it's like you're on your life's purpose. You're doing the things. You're writing four books, five, six, seven, eight, ten books in a year, whatever it is. I am over here. I'm doing these programs. I'm connecting with people, et cetera, et cetera. I'm doing my thing. And somehow, some way, boom, here we are together. Wow. So there is, as you referred to, that synchronicity in the universe. So when we tap into the signs, when we see the signs, when we, we as individuals interpret our own signs, okay? And it's not hard to do. You just... You need to let go of the uh, intellect for the most part to allow the impressions to come in of what those signs mean for you. Then we start to see this process. Um, are you are you optimistic about mankind and womankind's future? <laughs> you know, I am of the philosophy that there is nothing we need to fix, save, or heal. We don't need to fix, save, or heal anything on the outside. And we don't really need to fix, save, or anything on the inside. We are experience experiencing itself. The divine came through 8 million people and a gazillion other forms simply to experience different perspectives and different expressions. And so what we can do if we really want to serve the world is become radically selfish in terms of our own self-care and self-love. The more powerfully you do your work to be the best person you can be, to love yourself completely unconditionally, to have the most immense amount of compassion for yourself, to be willing to tap into your creative capacity as a divine on legs, that is changing the world. Because if you can unconditionally love yourself, if you can have compassion that is unending for yourself, if you are willing to allow yourself to be creative with no limits, then you will be totally accepting, unconditionally loving, compassionate, and celebrating every other being outside of you. The reason that I wrote the book Signs is so that we learn how to celebrate life, so that we see something bigger than ourselves, and we see ourselves bigger than ourselves. The reason that I wrote the book Signs is so that all of a sudden we realize that the mystical and the miracles that we hold our breath for, they're actually everywhere. They're all the time. We just haven't been seeing them. We haven't been seeing ourselves. And once you start to realize that every sign, every sacred encounter is you speaking back to you about you, you begin to realize that you are the pathway. You are the turning point and you are the divine guidepost on this planet. And that is how we change the world. Well, I will say that um, <clears throat> changing the world for the better for everyone, not just for a select few, is is my goal. That, and and again, I I don't know how that's going to come about. I don't know. I don't. I don't put my intentions or or my expectations on it. All I know that is it is possible. Am I am I speaking of a utopia? No, no. We're always going to have challenges. Um, I finally have reconciled that in myself, saying, why do we have to have these challenges to build character? I don't understand. But then when you start looking at nature, and you especially you start looking at with here in this in, in California, where we've gotten so much rain in the last few months, and you see how water is carving away. Uh, the hillsides um, and it goes, believe it or not, 
the water travels the path of least resistance, not most resistance, but least resistance. And we can do the same if we would just open up. And again, as you as you've elucidated um, to see the signs, I've also used the analogy of um, a river and um, we need to go out in the middle of that river. And if you can float on your back, I cannot. My eldest sister could. I can float on my face. I can drown real well, but I can't float on my back for some reason. In any event, you're floating there. Just allow the current to take you where it will take you and then do the things that you are led to do. And it's going to build your character. It's going to build your spiritual strength, your emotional, psychological strength, et cetera, et cetera. Is that, Remember, a, is that, go ahead. We incarnate for a reason. And the reason we incarnate is mastery. And what we forget every single day when we, especially when we bump up against a challenge or an obstacle is that these things are calling us to that mastery. You wouldn't go into a gym and start lifting weights and get to a place where you can lift 40 pounds and go, okay, don't want to lift any more than that. I'm just going to stay at 40 pounds or I'm going to drop back down to 35. You're going to go, wow, I can lift 40. I want to lift 50. And then I want to lift 60. You're going to keep building those muscles. Personal and spiritual growth are the same way. Every time you surmount yourself, every time you reach another level of mastery, of course you're going to have something show up because you're a master. Mm -hmm. And it's going to allow you to then stretch those muscles even more, to build them, to be more solid. That's what all of these experiences are. We live in a world of duality because this is a perfect place to build our muscle. And when we can get to a place of neutrality, when we can understand that we are part of this beautiful interconnected web, that we are a sign in ourselves to some people, then all of a sudden we don't have to take it all so seriously. We don't have to judge it. We can become neutral about different experiences, different people, the things that enter our lives. And ultimately that is the highest point of mastery to be mm. able to be neutral around everything that occurs, to see it all as light, not dark and light, but it's all light. Oh, you touch upon a subject that I struggled with for some time. I'm not alone either, but I did uh, struggle with this. The whole concept of duality. And I, um, uh, I am full of analogies. Let me tell you. Uh, we have the macrocosmic world and the microcosmic world. You're looking through the James Webb telescope out light years and actually into the past, technically speaking, but you're watching the universe and everything's moving and you've got supernovas exploding and you've got uh, asteroids colliding into each other and you've got all of this movement and all of this contact. And guess what? There's no judgment. Now go to the microcosmic world. And quite honestly, when I look at the microcosmic world, I see the macrocosmic world too. It's as above, so below, and as below, so above. And you see the same general happenings with the nucleus, uh, with the molecules and the atoms and the subatomic particles and so on and so on. Everything's spinning around and doing this and doing that. And, do and guess what? There's no judgment now. We come to a space, I haven't come up with a better phrase, the mid-crow. It's where you and I live, here, on this planet. And we look around and things happen. Ah! Ah! And there's judgment, uh, judgment galore. I mean, if you, could, if you could bottle it and sell it, we'd, we'd be in overabundance of judgment. But if you take a look at the macro and the micro worlds and there's no judgment, guess what? The mid-crow, if you will, it just is what it is. Ergo, there's no judgment. And that's really where I come from these days is, and quite honestly, no matter how, I, uh, I think that I may have fried a motherboard of a computer just the other day. I was trying to plug in a power supply and the chief engineer on the other end of the phone, uh, I told him what I had done. He says, I think you fried the motherboard. I'd never done that before in my life. I smelled no, I smelled no smoke and so on and so forth. 
And it's like, okay. And at first I felt bad about it. And then I thought, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. That was just an experience. It was a learning experience. You know, you've built computers before back in the nineties and early two thousands. Okay. So you, it, it's, it's not like there is, there aren't more and it's a learning experience. It's a life experience. How do we get to the place, Simran, how do we get to the place where we can think like that so we stop getting lost in our emotions, especially getting lost in our emotions? We have to slow down. <sighs> we have to be present. And, you know, life is doing everything it can to do that. You know, if you're hitting up against pebbles, rocks, and boulders in your life, that's a huge set of signs that is trying its best to say, be more present. And ultimately that's what the signs will do. And I think that that's why this is such a powerful work at this time, because more and more people are becoming awake and aware. They just don't necessarily know that they're becoming awake and aware to themselves, to what they're carrying that contributes to these fluctuations in the outer world. And once you realize that, you know, a happening that is taking place in the Ukraine or in Paris or in Tennessee or in Washington, D.C., all of those things are really reflections of the consciousness that we all carry. Then you start to take responsibility for your part in it. And you start to say, I need to get inside of my own head and look at what I'm carrying to contribute to what's happening out there. And that brings up an interesting um, uh, thing that I heard from uh, a gal who used to be on the station that I work for and how she used to talk about how when you take a look at those other things, you need to stop and see what's going on inside of you that sort of mirrors that, you know, what, what, what battle is going on inside of me, inside of me that I'm seeing out here in the Ukraine or the hurricane that's battering Louisiana or fl the Florida Keys or whatever it is or whatever, or the, the, the floods, what is flooding in my life right now? You know, in, in that respect, that's kind of what you're talking about. Yeah, she must have read my book Conversations with <laughs> Well, she must have read it. She must have read it psychically <laughs> because this was like 15 years ago. Well, that's about when I read wrote it. So oh my it's, goodness. It's <laughs> that's what that's everything I talk about. And I expound on that with really powerful illustrations mm -hmm. in the new book sign, Sacred Encounters with Pathways, Turning Points, and Divine Guideposts. That is so cool. That is so cool. We are talking with a wonderful woman who has written a book called Signs. And uh, you, my friends, as uh, I always like to say, are listening to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And uh, Simran, I want to thank you so much for uh, being a part of uh, this program and this conversation. I have, uh, I do actually have three other questions that I want to ask you to wrap up the program. But I've got one final question in the context of our conversation Tell me about the name Simarin. Where does that come from? That is a given name of mine, and it actually is a Sanskrit word. It uh, means remembrance of the divine. So in other words, uh, seeing oneself, hearing oneself, knowing oneself as proclaiming words as the divine would, and having that type of powerful creation in the world. And so I look at myself as a sign to other people to represent to them, Simran, the repetition and the mirror that they are the divine and that they need to be very, very cognizant of the words they speak because that is the divine speaking to the divine, creating the world that is out there that is a reflection of that divine that has been spoken and heard. Am I correct? There's also a second, uh, 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 another name that follows Simran Sai. Um, my full name is Simran Preet Singh. And Preet so Singh. Simran is the remembrance of the divine. Preet means love and Singh means lion. And so if you put that together and all of our names are signs, they represent who we are as an essence. Then I am the lioness of love that represents the remembrance of God. 
You also have other acronyms as well. Love Catalyst, a rebel humanitarian. I love that one. A rebel humanitarian. <laughs> An activist for greater balance, neutrality, compassion. Oh, and the most important one, inner peace. You want peace in the world? Then you'll find it within yourself. And it really goes to, I believe, a uh, a poem that is spoken in, in many can't remember if it's uh, Unitarian or, or um, uh, uh, Unity Churches. Nonetheless, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And that is a very powerful uh, statement for one to make uh, at any time. Uh, and um, uh, I have to say that's probably part of what's gotten me through this past year, with all of the changes to my family and, uh, and so forth. And I have to say that though, yes, I have shed those tears for both. Um, there's still, there has always been that undercurrent of peace, you know, knowing that uh, I will, I will reconnect with those members of what, what, what Dr. Newton of life between lives says is my cluster. Those essences, those souls that I have been going through uh, these different lifetimes with. And I'll be back with them again and and uh, we'll commiserate and so forth and then maybe reincarnate into something else. Uh, you know, uh, I I want to come back and help people, although I want to stay here right now and help people to, to understand what you're talking about as well. And that is uh, seeing the signs around us and and recognizing that, hey, we are looked after. I think that's one of the greatest messages that I've gotten from the ancient wisdom teachings is that the universe is, not will, is taking care of us if we'll just get out of the way. If we'll just get out of the way. I thank you so much for what you've shared with us today. Oh, thank you, Richard, for having me on. It's been delightful. And I hope everyone will pick up the book on signs and start looking for theirs. Absolutely. We'll encourage people to go to IamSimran.com and get a copy of the book. I'm sure it's available at Amazon and all of the other uh, outlets as well. Uh, we uh, also uh, want to uh, thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, where we are giving you choices like signs and knowledge of those uh, uh, choices uh, so that uh, your dreams will come true. We uh, are also asking you to uh, listen to the uh, broadcasts. They're here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., and Wednesdays at 9 a.m. with our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. We stream live at those times at richarddugan.com, and that's Pacific Time. I guess I should be more specific. And also podcasts on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM. And we're also on YouTube where you can watch these interviews. Reviews. I hope you'll subscribe, but even more importantly, you will select a, a notification so that every time I post a new conversation, you will know that there's something new to listen to. And I hope you'll do that. And also, if you'd like to support the work that we are doing, we have a PayPal account. It is there for your security as well as ours. And uh, when it asks you for the email address to whom the support is going to, uh, Richard at RichardDugan.com. Very easy. Richard at RichardDugan.com. And we also ask you to spend time going within and listening to that still small voice during this, the decade of perfect vision the 2020s, because that is where you will get that perfect insight is by going within. And with all of that being said, we go to our final three questions. And the first of those is, who is Simran? I am an example of what's possible, an example of love, of expression, creativity, and experience. I am a voice that is here for a period of time, an identity that is expressing for the purposes of bringing forth a message that is my divine piece of the puzzle. And in the moment that Simran disappears, infinity will remain. What is your life's purpose? My life's purpose is love. It is love and presence to the expansion of love. 
And in the context of this lifetime, what was your best day? My best day is always the day that I'm in. <laughs> there's no looking forward. There's no looking back. <laughs> Very good. Well, I want to thank you again for joining us here on Tell Me Your Story. And again, I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story. And until our next broadcast podcast video cast, this is getting longer and longer uh, the more life goes on and changes. Love to Lal. Jeanette, I am still listening. And Dad, be happy.